Moore, and they're both good conservatives. And um, she uh, works in the same law office that Jay Jackson, a lot of you know him, Jay Jackson's son is a lawyer in the office also down there in the plaza. So, um, and she uh, started out and has done great. Nine of the ten books have to do with the Civil War era or just before or just after it, except the one about Vietnam. And she almost got her claim to fame on that one as several times they tried to make it into a movie in Hollywood. It just hasn't worked out Still quite well. But, um, so anyway, and uh, I had her come tonight because she's written her tenth book now, Elizabeth's War. It's just exactly how ugly and bad things were here in Missouri and a lot of other places too. And, and so I asked her to just come and talk a little bit about that and what she's done up to now and then explain to us uh, what happened. Uh, to Elizabeth and those 16 kids or 14 kids or whatever and so it's uh, been friends for quite a while belong to several other organizations together so Diane Rogers Yay. thank you um, I thought I would start first by thanking you for having me to come um, I hope that I won't dis disappoint um, yes Jim and I have known each other for quite a while as a matter of fact he helped me to edit uh, the original first book in my series, Tomorrow's Promise. I wanted somebody who had an idea of what they were talking about to make sure that I had everything right, and he chastised me for saying rifles instead of carbines. So I fixed my carbines throughout the book, and um, he got me on the right path. And I always try and get somebody who is very um, authoritative on whatever part of the war I'm writing about so that I get it right. I'm kind of anal about having my facts right. Um, I write, obviously, mostly historical fiction, except for one naughty romance mm. that somebody bought already. <laughs> you can report really? back to us next time. <laughs> we'll, we'll have a book I wrote that one a long time ago. Oh, wow. I wrote that one a long time ago, and I was trying to find my genre and what I wanted to write in. So um, it was when I saw Dances with Wolves that I decided that historical fiction was really what I wanted to write about. Um, as Jim said, I live south of uh, Kansas City. I drive 110 miles, give or take, round trip to my home, but I figure it's a trade-off because I do have four horses, which I used to ride a lot <laughs> until I started writing and marketing. And so now I spend my weekends marketing or writing, depending upon what time of the season that it is. Um, I work for Polsonelli Law Firm on the plaza. Um, so um, that's where I drive to all the time and I do manage to put one new book out a year so it's kind of a again it's just what I like to do it's it's how I spend my extra time Saturday morning when I get up it's straight to the computer hmm. and it's just you know you do, I just have to to be uh, diligent I guess is the word that I'm looking for because my readers want more stuff so that said you may have noticed if you looked at any of the books, or you can see from where you are, that I write as D.L. Rogers. And, of course, it doesn't do me any good for you to know that I write as D.L. Rogers when I talk to you directly that I'm a girl. I think I am. <laughs> anyway, um, the reason I decided to write as D.L. is because my stepdad, who was an avid, avid writer, or reader, said, I'll never read anything written by a woman. Wow. Yeah. So I We're was not like, chauvinist like that at all. <laughs> so I was like, you know, Maybe. I want people to read my stuff because of its contents, not because I'm a man or a woman who writes. And I have actually found that I write my male character parts easier than my female because I've always been more of a tomboy than a girl. Um, and because back during these times, it's easier for me to write men because they can be strong. Whereas the woman, you know, you have to you have to really walk that tightrope of what is too strong for that time. You know, are they too strong and, and going over that line? So anyway, I do have a confession to make. I grew up as a Yankee. Oh. <laughs> but right. but okay, I grew up in New Jersey. <laughs> And I grew up with the assumption that I was taught as a kid that the Civil War was about slavery. And that was it. Hey, they teach that even in Southern <laughs> schools. <laughs> well, 
my, they don't know any better nowadays. Yeah. My, my dad was from Tennessee, though, and my mom was from New Jersey. And my dad's sister was married to the man that introduced my mom and dad together. So my cousin and I, which were only a couple months apart, we called each other Yebbles because we were half and half. And I've always said half and half. But then my dad, with whom I was speaking to the other night, I said, yeah, I said, my brother, my southern blood is kind of creeped up and, and come to the fore. And he says, well, you know, you're more than half southern. And I said, what? He said, well, do you remember where your grandpa came from? My mom's dad came from North Carolina. Yes. So, All right. so things are looking up. <laughs> so I'm three quarters. <laughs> so anyway, um, but when I moved here, when I became a member of the Civil War Roundtable, when I met Jim, and Jim, you've got a lot to do with it. Carolyn's got a lot to do with it. Jim and or Jay and, and Jackie, Carol Bowl. I mean, all those people. I've learned so much since I've been involved with that organization, and. I wanted to get the facts right, and so I've, I've, I've used Jackie's books, I've used a lot of local books by local authors, um, and I, I, I learned that the war had to do with states' rights, with politics. And I'm, I'm hearing that everybody here is a conservative, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go out on a limb here, and I'm going to say that when they, when they compare Obama to Lincoln, methinkest it's not because of his benevolence. It's because everything that, Ken uh, that Kennedy, that Lincoln did was politically driven. And that's what I've learned in my research recently. So if they compare him that way, yeah, because everything is done, that Lincoln did was politically motivated. Um, and also economics. Hey, the North told us that we're quite happy to let the South uh, secede until they thought, oh crap, we're going to lose all the revenue from that hay, or hay, <laughs> from the, <laughs> <laughs> the hay was one of from the cotton. That, that pill, we should have taken from the, it. Yeah, from the cotton. And they said, all that money is going to go to Europe. And they said, well, we, we can't tobacco. let that happen. Huh? Tobacco. Yes, tobacco and, and the cotton. They said, we, we can't let that happen. We, we got too much revenue that we're going to lose if we let them go. So we have Sugar. to keep them in, in the fold. So these are things that I have learned since I started researching for these books. Um, like I said, as a kid, we used to call ourselves Yebbles. And so, you know, I've always felt that southern tug, even though I grew up with the northern side of it. So I'm, and I'm happy to know that I found out a lot of the history in this area, which was pretty ugly. It yeah. was really, really ugly. Tough place to live. Um, as I'm sure you all know, everything started with the border war. And I'm not going to, last time I assumed everybody knew what I was talking about, they didn't, so I'm going to ask you if you know certain things, and if you don't, I'll tell you. And if you, if you do, then I'll just kind of gloss over it. Um, but the border war came first, and it was started because of Kansas-Nebraska Act in 54. Um, it set the pro-slavers against the free staters. And, and I only just recently realized how this worked was that um, Kansas and Nebraska were supposed to come in and they had to vote over who was going to come in free, who was going to come in as slave, and if both of them came in as one or the other, it was going to upset the balance of power. And so both sides were anxious. Nebraska was a given. Kansas was still up in the air. So the pro-slavers went over illegally and voted for them to become a slave state. And the um, abolitionists. Abolitionists, thank you. I had a migraine earlier, so sometimes I might be a little bit fuzzy. You're doing good giving her have one of those. <laughs> right. Normally they wipe you out all day long, you know? Um, so the, the abolitionists came over, they set up housekeeping, and they voted for a free state. So it got pretty ugly. And so we obviously had the border war here for a lot longer than the actual Civil War when it started in 61. Um, so being a transplanted Yankee, why do I write what I write? Like I said, it's because I've learned so much. 
I used to when I was a kid. I always played cowboys and Indians more than I ever did Barbies. I was outside running around and one of the things that I did, and I got in so much trouble for this, I loved the story about Jesse James. And this is when I was in New Jersey, so it must have been important to what I was going into. Anyway, I set up a, a bar and I was in, you know, Jesse James was going in to the bar and he was going to have himself a drink. Well, I had to have bottles of beer. <laughs> so the people next to me, they were drinkers and there were always empty bottles. So I went over and I grabbed a couple and guess what? They broke. And when I tried to hide them from my dad and anyway, long story short, I got into a lot of trouble because I lied to my dad that I didn't have beer bottles in the window well when I did. I think the only thing that saved me that night was my great grandmother was there, so he didn't whip my butt because they were allowed to then. Yes. Um, so um, let's see. The history I learned again, a lot of it I've learned which is what takes place here, in, right in our area. And I've learned about the towns of Austin, about Dayton, and Missouri, uh, Morristown. And, you know, when Quantrill raided Lawrence, I'm not condoning, I'm not saying that it was good or, or anything like that, but they sort of forgot that Osceola was burned to the ground already, that Austin, was becoming a ghost town, that Morristown was already gone, and uh, Dayton. Dayton was already burned to the ground. And so when the repercussions came from Lawrence's raid, Lawrence's raid, Quantrill's raid on Lawrence, it was almost like, well, yeah, you've struck back that's something we've been doing for years. And do you guys know how that strike back came? Oh, good, I get to go into it. Yay! <laughs> was it part of that also because of the, the, the raid that uh, Brown and his gang was doing on the Kansas City where the prison, the prison was keeping lots of... Uh, oh, the women. <coughs> women. The women went in. And I actually touched base about the women in one of in one of my books because I have my character there and but no that wasn't that was what led well they say it's what led the, Quantrill the final straw to Lawrence on the, yeah. Just before, yeah right when the when the building collapsed yes but I've read several accounts though where they had he he knew they were going somewhere but he hadn't told them quite where you know where they were going to go and so that was like Jim said the final straw that okay because I've, I've heard that they wrote in saying, you know, don't forget the murdered women, but then I've heard, you know, read that that wasn't the case. So, you know, history, how are we ever going to know for sure? Right. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. But, um, so, General Order Number 11 was the direct retaliation by General Thomas Ewing from Fort Union in Kansas City after the raid on Lawrence. And basically, what that order said was that anyone in four counties, Southern Jackson, so it was like Grandview and Belton, Belton's Cass. Belton is? Uh, oh, yeah, Belton's Cass. Belton's Cass. Cass County line is right there between. Yeah, Grandview is, Grandview okay, Grandview so Belton. it was Southern Jackson, uh, Cass County, Bates County, and the northern part of Vernon County. <coughs> Those four counties. The people were told, if you live in any of those counties, that you had to do one of two things. That you had to go into the, one of the four forts there, and there was Pleasant Hill, Harrisonville, Kansas City, and what is the other one? I can Hickman never, Mills. Huh? Hickman Mills. Hickman Mills. I can never remember what the fourth one is. There were four forts that they had to go in, and they had to either swear their loyalty declare. and move themselves to within one mile of those forts, okay, to be protected by yeah. the military. 
Okay? So one, even if you are considered a union person and swear your loyalty, you're still leaving your entire home open to the Kansas Seventh, the Red Redlegs, the Jayhawkers, and the Bushwhackers. Because they don't know who's who in an empty house. Okay? Regardless, you're, you're, you could be visited by any one of them. Now, if you don't want to do that, the only other th choice that you had was to go away, just leave. And you had 15 days to do it. So, in Elizabeth's War, in my book, what I've done is I started at the very beginning of the war. And I try and show how the father and the son are discussing what's happened. And the son is all, yeah, now we can fight. We're going to go get them. And the father's saying, who are you going to fight? Are you going to fight our neighbor over here who's a, who's a, 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 a yeah, constitutionalist? Or are you going to fight this guy over here who, who is a constitutionalist but has slaves? You know, who are you going to fight? And so, and I'm sure that, that, that a lot of people had that conversation because this area was where it was brother against brother, neighbor against neighbor, father against son. And it was so prevalent here, and especially in the Cass County area, because initially Harrisonville was more pro-Southern. And then after Harrisonville was sacked, it swung the other way, and they, they set up the fort there. And so where you had been in a, a, a pro-Southern county, now all of a sudden you're in a pro-Union county and you're in, you're in enemy territory. And Lane is, is uh, proclaiming that people in these areas, uh, you know, he's going to sick the, the uh, was it the state guard? No. He was gonna he was gonna sick somebody on it because they knew the territory. Probably and the Missouri Road militia or militia. something. Militia, I get them mixed up all the time. I cheat. I have it in the back there. Even when I have it right in front of me. I <laughs> it was all militia before the Civil War. Once the Civil War broke out, uh -huh. the Missouri State Guard became the South and then rolled the Missouri militia basically. Okay, so they rolled in and I know they did that in like February. When that when they were enrolled or they yeah, rolled out of the militia. The state guard and Price was ahead of the state guard. So anyway, um, where was I going? Uh, you can decide who you're going to fight. Oh, you yes, exactly. So so people really they did fight neighbors and friends that were that were right there with them. So. Um, you get a lot of that conflict in the early part of the book. You get a lot of, they're visited numerous times by who? Are they, they raiders? Are they red legs? Are they jayhawkers? You know, is it the seventh? Is it the militia? We, we don't know because they didn't know. All of the above. Huh? All of the above. All of the above, exactly. And, and that's what I try and show that one time you're visited by these guys, and the next time you're visited by these guys, and you're, you're thankful that they leave, and your family isn't somebody in your family dead, and that your house is still standing. But for those of you who might have seen a book called Reminiscences of the Women uh, the, of the Civil War, Missouri Civil War. Missouri Civil War, there are a couple stories in there about the uh, in inventiveness uh, of some of the women uh, who withstood these attacks. And so I've, I've used a couple of those in these, which are in that book, which are a little bit comical. Um, you can just imagine a woman who has four young children trying to keep men, armed men, out of her home who are threatening her. And I don't know about you guys, if you've got kids, grandkids, I have a bit of a fuse, but boy, once that fuse pops, if my kids or my grandkids are being threatened, you don't want to be around because I'm going to do whatever it takes. And so this is what Elizabeth does. So then we find out um, about the order. And I have her do what's necessary for her to save her family. And she's very inventive. She does what I guess I would do. I won't tell you what. but. Um, it's, I think it's kind of inventive, and by the time the order rolls around that they have to leave, she leaves with her neighbor, who has 
nine children. And this is a fact that her neighbor did have nine children. And she had five, but her oldest son, Stephen, was already fighting. And he was actually at the Battle of Lone Jack. So they leave with 13 children in tow, one of which was nine months old. So you can imagine the issues that went along with that alone. Um, they are, you know, hit with raiders, with foragers, and if, if any of you know about Order Number 11, it happened, um, they had to be gone by September 9th. Now, in the, the time that it took them, oh, and they decided they were walking from Austin to St. Clair County, basically Osceola. So that's 60 some miles with 13 children. And I'm following. It's hot. It's a little wet. It was the middle of a drought. There was no water. Um, there was no food. So, and most, a lot of them were barefoot by this time. Um, it was, it was horrible, horrible, horrible conditions. And and every time that they get something to some sustain themselves, somebody wanted to try and take it away. So there's a lot of trials and and hardships in the, in this book that. I've tried to show the inventiveness of people and the hardships that they had to go through. And, and when there was water, you had everybody that were, was on the trail ahead of you, on the road, that the road was just dust. Everybody was the same color, everybody was a gray-black, just covered with soot because the road had been churned up so much by so many people leaving the counties that it was, it, it looked like 9-11 after the towers came down, everybody was the same color. And it didn't matter whether you were four-legged or two-legged or what color you were if, as a two-legged. Everybody looked the same. So um, anyway, I, I do show um, the burning of Dayton. I do show both battles at Morristown and how Morristown became Camp Johnson and how they destroyed Dayton. Um, Osceola, I don't show the burning, but I talk about it because that's where her relatives are, so she finds out about it. She goes south and doesn't even know whether they're alive or not because they didn't have any way to know. Um, so um, when uh, Anthony came in to Dayton, I don't know if you guys are familiar with the burning of Dayton at all, but he came in from Camp Johnson because a Union sympathizer from Dayton came in and said there was recruiting going on there. And so he rode 25, 26 miles, I think it was, from Morristown slash now Camp Johnson to Dayton. And when he got there and there, weren't any, there wasn't anybody there that were being retru recruited, there was just women and children, except for three men that had nothing to do with the military. He tramped them out and killed them and then burned the town to the ground, with the exception of one house, that being the Union man who had ridden to uh, Fort uh, Camp Johnson to let them know about the recruiting. So I go into that with someone who was there. Um, so there's a lot of local history in this one. Um, in my other books, I have written about the Civil War, but I've written it from not as close quarters because the person that I, Elizabeth McFerrin is the person that I write about. Now I changed her name because McFerrin, Elizabeth McFerrin was a real person and she lived pretty much where I live right now within a couple of miles. And I met her through Tom Rayfiner's book Caught Between Three Fires. And when I read about her, it was, she jumped off the page and said, I said, where does she live? Show me where she lives, because I gotta know. And it was like, you know, you just have that little voice saying, write my story, write my story. And so that's what I wanted to do. I really wanted to write her story. I was finishing up on the series, um, which started out as one book, morphed to three, and wound up becoming seven. So, and that is because my readers, after I did the tr original trilogy, I started selling them as a trilogy, and say if I, I sold to you guys here, you had a year, I came back next year and spoke to you, my readers would come back and say, oh, I read that trilogy, it was awesome, what's next? And I said, 
uh. no, nothing <laughs> and they were like no that's not acceptable next year when I come back to like Cass County Fair or wherever I want another book so I decided okay if my readers want more books I guess I'm doing something right so I started taking secondary characters from the original trilogy, which gave me six books, and then I went to my publisher, Carolyn Bartels, and said, am I done right? Can I, can I do Elizabeth's story now? And she said, nope. You gotta tell us how White Oaks, which is the ranch that everybody went to and, and left from, where it came from, which it's in Grandview. We kind of figured it's in, in Grandview, just south of Kansas City. So they were close enough to get into the city of Kansas at the time. And, um, but yet, so, they, so they, they could be in town when the building collapsed with the women that were in it, um, things like that. And that's the way I like to show history. I like to have my characters witness what they can, um, when they can. And I'm kind of anal about my history, and um, if I'm not real sure, I, I don't use it. Because I like to, I like to put in there stuff that's confirmed by people who know. Um, when I was writing about stuff in uh, Charleston, I worked with a gal from the Historical Society or something down in Charleston, and she gave me information about just Christmas trees at that time. You know, you think of Christmas trees as being tall. She said, no, they never would have had a tall Christmas tree. They always were on a table, and they always had a bucket of water next to them because they used candles to light them. So, yeah, so who would have thought? So that's the kind of little tidbits that I like to put into the books. Um, Caleb is, uh, I don't have a copy of him today, but he's about a former slave who goes <coughs> north to find out who he is as a man after the Emancipation Proclamation. And trust me, it's not what he thinks it's all touted out to be. Um, so I have my characters, and I don't want to keep you too awful long, but um, my characters in, in the series start out in, in 1827 on a steamboat trip up Missouri to uh, Independence. And in 1827, if you guys know the history of Independence at all, it's a pretty wild and woolly town. And it's maybe been in existence six months or so. And so they're there. They become mercantile or, or shop owners right when the Oregon Trail is opening. So they make a few dollars and they build White Oaks, which is, like I said, the ranch where everyone comes, comes back home to or leaves from. And the cool thing, when I, when I started these books, I never had any idea of where they were going. I just always set up secondary stories and they just all kind of ran how they were supposed to. But there's a, the, the characters are a, are a Confederate young girl who watches the firing on Fort Sumter. There's a Union soldier. There's a woman who is captured by Lakota and spends a year with Lakota. Um, there's um, the, the mercantile couple. And then we have a girl, a woman, Maggie, who's my personal favorite, because I guess she's kind of me. She goes out west to Cheyenne and eventually rides the, the Cheyenne Deadwood stage to report for the Cheyenne Sun on the Deadwood fire back in 17, or 1879. And that in itself is kind of comical um, because uh, every, a lot of people mistook her for Calamity Jane. <laughs> yeah. So uh, aren't you her because she would dress like a man? Because it's like, why? Would I want to wear a skirt on a stagecoach when I might have to ride a horse or do whatever? So she was quite the outspoken, forward-thinking woman. Um, and Amy, like I said, she was a, a southern gal. And uh, so we have a half-blood uh, in Brothers by Blood. He was half white and half Lakota, and it's his kind of coming of age. And then in Ghost Dancers, he is the Confederate or the uh, Union soldier who. Um, eventually fights against the Indians at the, the uh, Little Bighorn. So I go from the opening of, the, of independence through the entire Civil War, through the Indian Wars that culminates with the massacre at Wounded Knee. And I actually, when I, when I write about the Battle of Little Bighorn, I write it 
from the Lakota point of view. I actually found a book, yeah, I found a book written by a man in the 50s, 1950s, who was raised by Lakota, either his, either both parents, he was adopted, or one parent, I can't remember how it went, but basically he stated that at the Little Bighorn, um, Custer came down in the middle of the, of the uh, camp, and that he was one of the first ones killed. And so there's a lot of stuff that I learned, and I don't know if, what you guys think about Custer or, or what, but I don't have a whole lot of respect for him. And I'll tell you what, as a kid, I would stay up to all hours of the night to watch They Died With Their Boots On. And now uh. I watch it and I go, oh, that is so wrong. So it's amazing how learning a little bit of your history changes your thoughts about history itself. That's so, true. So. Real true. You learn the real truth, you're like, well, that guy wasn't such a good guy yeah, after exactly. all, you know? And that's what I try, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Regarding Custer, uh -huh. a lot of what we know today is primarily due to his wife. Uh -huh. And her promotional, she was unending, untiring. Absolutely, that absolutely. That devoted her life to that legend. Yep. To he creating the legend yes. or preserving yes. it or whatever? Yes. Yeah. Okay. He, in another book that I've read, he supposedly had an Indian mistress. So, and, you know, when they, when they mutilated the men on the battlefield at the Little Bighorn, they did not mutilate Custer. And a lot of it was perpetuated that it was because, you know, he was so revered and the Indians didn't want to, the Indians didn't want to touch him because they thought he was an idiot. And they didn't want to catch it. So, yeah. <laughs> so, you know, and I try and put that subtly into my book so that surprisingly enough you're learning about our history without realizing it and, and a lot of people have thought oh, I didn't know that and they'll go and they'll look it up and they'll go well heck I didn't know that but that's right um, one of the books Bury My Heart with Wounded Knee became my my writing bible for Brothers by Blood and Ghost Dancers and that was just horrible what happened chasing the Indians and stuff. And then I've got the horse meat march after the little big horn, things like that. So anyway, I won't, I won't take up any more of your time, but feel free to look at them. Um, I'm just going to make them all one price tonight of, of $12 if you're interested. If not, just feel free to take a sheet and contact them later, whatever. Um, any questions? Yeah, I'm interested in the Western stuff, too. I mean, the War of Northern Aggression is more my thing, but I study a lot of mountain men and out West. And, yeah, I have a big Western book, and it has a picture of all these. And a lot of the guys that took pride in sliding the buffalo, which one of the hunting it was to kill off the Indians, were the same Union soldiers that did all the atrocities against the South that went taking pride in slaughtering the Indians. And there's this picture, and it says, I forgot which mass massacre it was, because I read about Wounded Knee and... Uh, the same one, can't think of it. several different Rose ones, bus. but it shows them in front of their guns. They were like cannons, but I forgot what they called them. And they just surround this village and they just sprayed them on them all down the whole little village. Yeah, it was, and it yeah, said, were good. said 20, like 20 of them got congressional yeah, medal of honors for this. It's like, I'll show you how screwed up the feds and their military and their Yankee soldiers are that they got congressional medal of honors for just. Right, that was probably warriors. like you said, Sand Creek. There was uh, yeah, Sand Creek, Wichita Sand Creek. or yeah. the battle at uh, Washita. There was one at the Washita Creek also that they were, and uh, the, the really thing was that Black Kettle was at both of them. Same Indian chief was at both of them. So, um, but yeah, I, and and that's the thing. If you want to talk about any people that have been oppressed. It's Native Americans. Oh, yeah. I mean, they, they've been horribly, horribly oppressed. And so, anyway, um, that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. And we got any more questions? Don't need to change a thing. Are your books available on Amazon.com? In ebook form. Okay. Um, otherwise, the, there's, there's a couple that are through, um, through Amazon but not easily. I always tell people if they're, if they're interested, if they're not wanting to buy tonight, to just take a card and email me, and I can either you know, mail them to you, or I can meet you on my way home from work, because I come by, I can go this way, I can go that way, I can go all kinds of different ways 
to get home. So I do meet people and drop off books. I always feel like I'm in a plane. I live up in Clay people. County, north of the river. Okay. Have you been around that area? I, I lived in Plano for a while. So, so not Plano. Geez, Gladstone. Gladstone. That's Gladstone. Plano, yeah. Plano, I'm from there too. Plano, Texas. Plano, Texas. Plano, Texas. <laughs> Plano, Texas. <laughs> Plano, Texas got better weather than Gladstone yeah. right now. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, I got I'm Plano on my mind too. Hey, yes. Have you done very much studies on City Bull himself or his family? Not much per se specific, other than what I used in my book. Do you have a specific question or? Well, I just had a comment. His daughters were supposedly pretty beautiful women. Uh huh. Uh, they actually married one of my cousins. Who's an really? Utterback, who's an Utterback, yes. Oh, wow. Very city bull's daughter. Uh, Utterbacks were 1714 German immigrants uh, back in Virginia. And I guess my cousin was the blacksmith up there. And married Sitting Bull's sister. I have it right on my phone right now. If you want to take a check or take a gander at it, uh -huh. <laughs> uh, I actually just Googled it while you were talking because I knew my cousin married Sitting Bull's daughter. Oh, wow. Up there. And it mentions Custer and all of them here as well. Uh -huh. You know, Sitting Bull had maybe hundreds of kids. I mean, he had many kids with really many wives. Oh, really? yeah. 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 I got that. I got that from a guy who says he's. Sixth sitting bull or something, and he was dancing there at the Crazy Horse Museum. Oh, he's wow. one. They had some, uh, and these three guys come out and do this Indian dance there at Crazy Horse, and oh, they're they're real deal Lakota or whatever. I, I'm just sitting bull with you. Was he, was he Lakota, Lakota soon? Lakota, yeah. But um, but he's like, yeah, I'm six. And anyway, he kind of told me a little bit, but it sounded like sitting bull had many many children. <laughs> lots and lots. Well, does anybody know the story about what Sitting Bull did the night before the Little Bighorn? Or leading up to the Little Bighorn, I should say. He, he had, they had their, their sun dance. It was, uh, I think it was before the Rosebud. I can't remember exactly because the Rosebud, Rosebud was only a week or so before the Little right. Bighorn. Right. Right. Um, but I can't remember exactly when the sun dance was. I think that may have been in June, and then it was like June 17th was the rosebud, and then the 26th was, 25th, was the little big horn. But basically, Sitting Bull went out after everybody else had, had done the, uh, the, sun dan the sun dance where, the, the, uh, where they pierced themselves. Hmm. Anyway, and then pulled them out. If you've seen A Man Called Horse, you know what I'm talking about. Anyway, um, he prayed, and then they took 50 slices of skin, about an inch long. I'm not sure if it was an inch wide, but I'm sure they were an inch in one direction. And they took 50 pieces of skin. They say he didn't make a sound, that he just bore it, but that, that was when he probably was in so much pain, and he had fasted for so long that he had this vision that said that the soldiers will fall and they will have fall from the sky and they will have no ears and that's because they won't listen to us yeah. so that was what his basic prophecy was his prophecy was that they would win the big battle and so everybody thought after they won the little bighorn that whoo you know this was great but he kind of knew better that I mean, he wouldn't let them follow them or anything he said, because there were, there were soldiers that were stuck in the woods, and they said, basically, they were only alive because they let them go. Because Sitting Bull said, no, there's been enough killing. Let's, let's honor those that are dead, both our people and their people, and let them go away. Basically, that's the only reason that they were still alive. Yeah, because so. yeah, it was like that whole company of men or something that well, never yeah. quite got engaged in the battle or yeah. something. Well, the Custer didn't wait watched. for his other group to show up. There was another group of bashed him. soldiers that went, were supposed Kino. to come from another way. And he looked down and said, there's a whole village. I'm going to take it. And his Indian scout said, no, you better wait. And they started doing their death dances because they knew they were about to get slaughtered. But right. he, he, there was another detachment that he was supposed to wait on. And him being the arrogant blue belly was, he was Oh, there's a whole Sioux nation. I'm going to slaughter them. And he went well, down we don't there want them to and took away. off 5,000 plus to Dakota yeah. Sioux. There was three armies coming in there. There was Terry's, there yeah. was Custer's, and there was uh, Crook. Ben, Phil, what a, Crook. Three. Yeah. Crook. Crook. Yeah. Where was yeah. Benteen? And George Crook is the one that followed him after. Where was Benteen and all this now? 
Ben he was is the Custer. one. He was part of Custer's. Yes. Okay. Yes. And Keo. Right. Ben Teen and Reno were part of Custer's. Right. And right. Reno's troops, I believe, were the ones that were in the woods. Yeah, near the river. my southern history. I huh. Yeah. And they're Just the ones that live. Now, Reno. Oh, yeah. Who was? The one that was Reno is the one that they questioned him afterwards, why didn't you assist or whatever, and it was basically, there was nothing we could do, and besides, they all hated Custer anyway, Kehoe, who was the supply master or whatever, he pretty much said, I'm not going. Yeah, that, that looks like own, suicide. <laughs> Reno had the past colonial ancestral and then, uh, the other guy battlefield. was forced Man to attack the south end of the village, the which he did. A anyway. crazy horse and beat him, and he drove them from. back up into the hills. Mm -hmm. About the same time, Custer came down from the other end. Mm -hmm. And uh, I read that account in that, that Indian book, of, uh, and that, that was very interesting. Their perspective was that when, when, uh, when Custer's men charged across the river, mm -hmm. there was one trooper that fell off his horse. They, that you know he'd been hit, and he said the whole charge just stopped right there, oh, and everybody got it. off the horse and they picked this guy up, and then they retreated back up the hill. So they they say that they killed Custer right there. That that was him. That, that right, and that's what I've read. That he was if killed If it just been on. an ordinary trooper, they would not have stopped. Yeah, they kept going. Yeah, and okay, here's my other. If you know a lot about Custer, you might. This is my other thing that I learned was that I don't think that Custer was the one that was left on the bat that was the last man standing. No, he killed okay. the river. Here's here's my assessment, okay? It is that the night before Custer had his hair cut, okay, to look pretty for the battle. He gave his fringed jacket to his brother Tom. And there were five Custers there. There were three cousins, aside from Tom and uh, George, okay? And so when they depict, if Custer was one of the first to fall, then who was it that was the last man standing that had a fringed jacket and long hair? The brother. I think it was the brother. Yep. That's my opinion. So anyway, anybody else? Oh, I read some accounts where it said he wasn't the first, but it said, you know, partway through the battle, this native account said that, that he had heard that one of the big chiefs had fallen and his yellow hair and long hair. Right, both. They, 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 they called them both, yeah. Well, and that nobody took credit for the killing of Custer until many, many, many years later because they were afraid of reprisals for being the one that, because of Libby and making him a hero and so you know you're the one that killed this hero they're not going to open their mouth and, and do I'll that. I'll fritz your head. Yeah exactly. So anybody else? He said they didn't want to touch him but I've read less of folklore but I've read several different accounts where they said they did poke holes in his ears so he'd hear better in the afterlife. <laughs> well I don't know that they did him, that's very possible, but they didn't mutilate him the way they did the other soldiers. Yeah, not but, like scalp or do anything right. to the body, but poke holes. And then fingers. again, again, there's a reason why they do that too, and yeah. it's a spiritual one. Yeah. Basically, they think if they, if they pierce your ears, you can't hear them, or they can't hear you in the afterlife. If you take off their hands, they can't use it, you know, to, to fight you with the bow and arrow. Um, if they can't see, they can't see you in the afterlife. So there was, again, a religious background. So why taking off your hair? I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, that I don't know. <laughs> well, you know, that, <laughs> you, you know who started that, though? Lately? Do you know who started that, though? Taking scalps? Who? Why the French. Oh, no, that was the French <laughs> back in the 1700s, I think. So they're kind of white guys. <laughs> yeah, that started a long time before the Indians ever did. I think I know more than I thought I did. <laughs> wow. We all still learn something new Yay. every day, you know? All right, should we give her a hand? Yay.